Well, first on the lineup tonight, the Institute of Economic Affairs, IEA, is proposing a cap on the country's annual borrowing to prevent further rise in the debt level, which has reached unsustainable levels and could throw gains chalked by the country. It wants Parliament to implement an appropriations bill for borrowing similar to the policy imposing expenditure ceiling. This system is used by the U.S. Congress to rein in executive borrowing. There's more in this report. At a press briefing on the 2021 budget and economic policy, the Institute of Economic Affairs said if government wants to borrow beyond the initial borrowing for whatever reason, it must return to parliament for approval. Director of Research Dr. John Kwachi, however, expressed satisfaction by the finance minister's commitment to narrow the debt to gross domestic product ratio and also improve significantly the debt to liquidity ratios. Now, the minister himself stated that the outcome of Ghana's debt sustainability analysis indicates a high risk of debt distress. Although he said the trajectory was sustainable. So going forward, you know, the, the economy is expected to grow and the deficit, at least they have tried to put it on a declining path. So when these two come together, you expect that the debt profile at least will improve. So it is in view of this uh, anticipated positive development that the IMF, for instance, has described Ghana as having a high, debt of, high risk of debt distress today, but has also said that the debt is manageable going forward. Revenue mobilization has been a long-standing challenge with Ghana's effort falling considerably short of that of its peers. The argument is that substantial revenue is lost annually through various channels including tax exemptions, property tax, illicit financial flows, amongst others. The IEA is therefore calling for these loopholes to be plugged for adequate revenue to be raised to support the country's development. Dr. John Kwachi again. Revenue effort, mobilization effort, falls considerably short of that of our peers. We have been saying this, you know, forever. And we have long argued that substantial revenue is lost annually through various channels, including tax exemptions, uh, property taxes, illicit financial flows, non-compliance, informal sector, administrative lapses, and fraud and corruption. If you go back to look at uh, the news, I mean, the statement that we gave you ahead of this budget, you will see that we mentioned all these factors. They are in there. So how did the minister respond, or what, did he respond to uh, you know, these uh, uh, lapses? And as I said, we, we have called for these loopholes to be plugged for adequate revenue to be raised to support the country's de de uh, development. So we are pleased to note that the budget proposed measures to plug some of these loopholes, in addition to other measures to scale up revenue. And that was the IA's thoughts on the 2022 budget. Let's head to Parliament, where the House is continuing with the debate on the budget, with a focus today on health, trade, and other sectors of the economy. Chrissy Parker-Wilson uh, joins me from Parliament. And Chrissy, the big story tonight uh, has been the minority questioning the absence of the Finance Minister, Ken Oferiata. Right, so Daryl, you know that it's been the practice there in Parliament that every time there's a budget debate, the finance minister is in the house to monitor the debate, of course, also take a few notes of the concerns raised by members of parliament, of course, from uh, board majority and the minority caucus. But today, interestingly, the finance minister, Ken Ofriata, is not present in the house, and then the minority had concerns and, and indicated to the speaker that the speaker perhaps uh, should suspend the sitting for today, or no, I mean, suspend the sitting for a while until they get the finance minister or any of his deputy appear before uh, a parliament to monitor the process. But there was a defense advanced by the majority side of the House, and that was coming from the deputy majority leader, Alexander Feyomakin, where he indicated that uh, the minister was with parliament during the 
post-budget debate in Ho, and that happened over the weekend. And so it is okay if the minister is not present in the chamber. Already he's gotten to have a better appreciation of some of the concerns raised by the members uh, when they went to Ho. So uh, it doesn't really change anything if, if he's not in the house. Uh, but the minority insisted that the, 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 the minister uh, should appear. Later, we picked up information that there were individuals from the finance ministry, some analysts who were in the chamber. And so this prompted the speaker to rule that since there were analysts from the finance ministry in the chamber, uh, suffice it to say that they are here representing the finance minister. And so they can proceed with the uh, debate of the day. So that's how uh, the whole matter ended, even though the minority members were not enthused about the speaker's ruling because the speaker pointed out to them that he challenged them to, to point to show or, or provide evidence uh, which suggests that the minister himself must be present in parliament before they can proceed with the debate. The, the minority couldn't do that, and so the speaker ruled, and then they proceeded with the debate. Of course, I mean, many of the members of parliament who are spoken today on the debate have been making a case for or against the approval of the budget. And of course, those making the case for are members of the majority where they've been comparing data analysis from the NDC administration as compared to the NPP administration. Reports uh, from you has to do with the COVID-19 expenditure and calls for a probe. Tell us about that. Exactly. So the issue about the COVID has been very central in this budget. The majority members have been making the point that in spite of the pandemic, still government managed to uh, ensure that things were in order. In fact, they managed the economy prudently. Uh, this point actually was made by the health minister and also the minister responsible for lands and natural resources. In fact, for someone like Bujina Paul, he was comparing the data between 2001 and 2014, where he claims that there were budget deficits. In 2014, about 11.9 budget deficit. This was a period where Ghanaians were not going through any form of pandemic. But here we, we are in 2020, and the budget deficit is just about 11.5, 11.4, which tells you that indeed the current administration is managing the economy better than what the NPP did. The health minister backed it by saying that the whole period of four years under the John Mahama administration, the country was plunged into doom so, and that means that they were mismanaging the economy, uh, health had issues, but today they've been able to network health infrastructure. If you go to the various hospitals, you realize that now they are going paperless. These are improvement infrastructure that they've been making uh, across the, the country, and of course, the time that they came to power. And one particular thing, Daryl, you yeah. know that the procurement of the spoken V vaccine became a topical issue here in Parliament. The minority has filed a motion to audit the COVID expenditure. The, the health minister says that he welcomes the, the, the probe because he has nothing to hide. There were evidence to show the use of the funds. And so if anybody would want to probe into or audit the COVID expenditure, he welcomes that. But there is one thing the members of the House should observe, that without revenue generation, it would be very difficult for government to execute the project or the things outlined for the year 2022. And you know that we are talking about Agenda 111 and other health infrastructure. So without the revenue, how can we build the roads? How can we build the Agenda 111 and other things that would help cushion the Ghanaian or the ordinary citizen, especially when it comes to unemployment? So right. the majority has been making the point that this budget seeks to address peculiar challenge within the economy, including unemployment and other things, where the minority too has been saying that, well, this budget obviously would further burden the ordinary Ghanaian because of the e-levy. And let me say, consistently, the contributors to the budget from the minority side have made their point clear that they are going to oppose the introduction of the e-levy. So it's becoming quite interesting here in Parliament. And I must say that the majority guys have been appealing to them. They're appealing to their conscience to try and support the budget approval. So uh, on Friday, that is when we are going to conclude the budget debate. We'll see how it goes, whether the minority 
will finally listen uh, to the majority and of course uh, support the budget or they'll continue to maintain their position as to kicking against the, the introduction of the e-levy. We are watching closely. Thank you so much. Uh, Chrissy Parker Wilson there, our parliamentary correspondent, bringing us up to speed. He talked about the e-levy. And so as the debate on the budget continues, government is projecting almost 7 billion cities in revenue from the tax on electronic transactions or e-levy by the end of next year. Let's hear from uh, Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. John Kuma, who spoke earlier with George Raffi. The more important reason why we must all as a tax net, let everybody be part so that we can spread. The number has not improved, Doc. Because Which number? The number of total no, the, persons this, who are paying tax. No, no. This was, Unless it has not this been is published 2022. yet. Okay. I mean, this will take effect in 2022. Okay. Another step that we have taken mm. is when we uh, replaced 10 numbers in Ghana, mm. which was about 4.6% of the population, with the Ghana card it immediately shot it to about 86%. Okay, mm -hmm. so now uh, the potential taxpayers in Ghana, as far as visibility to the law is concerned, is about 86%. Mm -hmm. So we now have to make sure all professionals, people who have not been paying their taxes, you'll be there and you receive a letter, a love letter from the race mm -hmm. team that you are estimated to pay this uh, income tax, but you have not. and so come and show cause why you should not pay. Mm. So all those programs have been put in place mm. and it is part of the 2020 measures for enforcement. Mm. Okay. So it's not just about the year tax, but we are doing a number of compliance uh, uh, engagements to ensure that we are able to rake in more revenues. And one good thing that happened in this budget mm. is that we took away about five different taxes yeah. from people. Isn't in our venues tonight, the Institute of Directors Ghana is poised to wage war against poor corporate governance. President of the Institute, Roxanne Dogbegan, says a draft bill on directors' code of ethics has been submitted to Parliament for consideration. Now, speaking to Joy Business at the fourth Corporate Governance Excellence Awards organized by the Institute, Mr. Dogbegan said the bill, when passed, will give his outfit the legal backing to name and shame organizations and directors engaged in unethical practices in the industry. Nobody is resolved to wage war against poor corporate governance. And to do that, we need to have the appropriate legislative backing. You know, and that is why we are pushing the agenda to have the draft bill. Secondly, we also need a national corporate governance code that will be an overarching policy, you know, to promote the culture of good corporate governance. Currently, we have, you know, various scattered codes. The banking sector has their code, SEC has their code, a lot of people have their codes. But we need one umbrella code, which we'll call the National Corporate Governance Code, which will be structured in a manner that promotes accountability, that promotes ethical culture, that will promote the appropriate controls in a manner that will, you know, encompass all of the frameworks that we have currently, and which will make it easy for investors to have one reference point. And you're watching Business Live. Still to come, Ghanaian health startup Yamachi Biotechnology is determined to improve cancer care in Africa through research. We'll learn how far it has come. That story right after this break. And welcome back to Business Live. Over 15,000 Ghanaians died of cancer last year, according to the Global Cancer Statistics. It is a significant public health problem, but little research is done on cancer here in Africa. That is what inspired Ghanaian health research startup Yamachi Biotechnology. The Joy Business Fan is there tonight. The Joy Business Van is brought to you by EcoBank, the Pan-African Bank, and MTN everywhere you go. Cancer is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. 
the disease is expanding fast in sub-Saharan Africa. It affects hundreds of thousands and millions more could pay the price. However, little research is done on the disease here in Ghana. In Accra, a health research startup is working to develop cancer detection and cure strategies. The goal? Lowering the economic burden of cancer on the African continent. Biomedical researcher Dr. Yabidiako is one of the founders of the health research startup Yamachi Biotechnology. Cancer is a significant public health problem. However, if you looked at the research that is being done in Africa in the areas of biomedical research, cancer doesn't really feature. Um, and so I felt that as a new company coming up, you know, when you're starting a new company, a new initiative, you try to find areas that are currently underserved because that gives you an opportunity to have impact, but also gives you an opportunity to create or to carve out a niche for yourself. Um, and so I felt that cancer presents a present problem, but also presents a pr problem of the future. About 800,000 people in Africa die of cancer every year, while a million cases are recorded annually. 15,000 of the deaths were recorded in Ghana in 2020. And that is why Yamachi is aiming to improve cancer care through greater understanding of human genetic diversity. And that requires technology. Co-founder David Hatchful oversees everything tech at Yamachi. I've always been interested in using technology to try and improve people's lives. Uh, Yao approached me and he was interested in starting a business and you know starting one in Ghana and I've done that a couple of times and so we started having a conversation and this idea of a cancer research firm uh, really struck me because of the, the boldness of the idea and also the potential impact if we actually knock this out one out of the park, uh, which I think we can. In April 2021, Yamachi started his journey to redefine how cancer is diagnosed and treated in Africa through innovative, sustainable biomedical research. All right, so let me take you into the lab now. Um, standard practice is I have to wear lab coats, even though these days I don't do as much lab work. Um, but let me get, get suited up appropriately. So, um, this is sort of um, a typical um, high-tech, you could call it, molecular lab. Um, here we do, majority of what we do here are molecular tests. So this is where we would be preparing samples for research, uh, preparing samples for analysis, but also for our diagnostic work, whether it is viral testing, um, and others, we would be, um, this is where we would be doing them. So these are, like I said, these are bays where we do research, these are centrifuges um, and different supplies that we use for our work. In the engineering team, what we focus on are building tools that help uh, the cancer researchers uh, do their work better. And we are targeting both uh, people who do primarily cancer research, but also clinicians who are involved in day-to-day -day, uh, sort of uh, care of patients, allowing them to collect data in a manner that allows them to easily um, uh, analyze it to get uh, uh, data out of it. Uh, the other piece we're doing is uh, the bio team um, sequences, uh, the genomes, um, and once they get that information, we digitize that information, and so my team is working on building uh, machine learning pipelines that can take that data, uh, analyze them, and try to find interesting patterns that then the research and medical teams can take uh, to try and improve on the, either the diagnostics or generally our knowledge of, of cancer in this part of the world. Yamachi is making significant progress already since it started to operate. It has got enrolled by Y Combinator, arguably the world's prestigious startup accelerator based in Silicon Valley in the US. Yamachi was one of 15 selected from Africa and the only startup from Ghana. Dr. Bidiako says it's a sign of Yamachi's international competitiveness. The other thing that I'm really proud of, which is probably I'm even more proud of because it speaks to the work we are trying to do, is a project that we just announced um, the last couple of weeks where we are working with a US-based um, cancer diagnostic company 
to do a research study in Ghana of a new cutting edge cancer diagnostic tool. This is a tool that is currently being used and is available um, in the United States, it's available in parts of Asia, but has never been evaluated in a predominantly African population. Um, it's a tool that allows you to detect blood, uh, sorry, detect cancer by just taking a blood sample. So they call it a liquid biopsy. Yamachi started with just a laptop and an idea. Over time, the health research startup has been able to win over a mix of local and international investors. However, the research work comes with its challenges. We face many of the challenges that our colleagues at the academic institutions also face. Um, largely logistical challenges of getting reagents, getting supplies, most of which are manufactured abroad. We have to get them into the country. That increases the cost of the work we do. Um, obviously, when you are importing things, you also have to pay customs duty. A biotech company ultimately makes money by developing products and data that are of commercial value. Dr. Bidiaku says the runway is long. Yamachi is looking to raise some more grant money, but also get some revenue from his diagnostic services. We are quite confident that we are hitting our KPIs. Um, I think value of a company is determined more than just revenue. So, you know, we are a little bit, we, we, I, I, won't, I won't be put into a corner to say when we will, we will, we will, we will sort of break even um, from a revenue perspective. Um, but I believe that, you know, what we are doing is important. We are, we are, we are succeeding so far um, and we intend to continue to succeed. Hatchful is just as optimistic about the future as Dr. Vidyako is. The kind of data that we have in our bodies as Africans um, really uh, stands the opportunity of opening a lot of doors to cures that can really help us tackle this uh, cancer problem. Um, and so I think we are at the right place at the right time and we have the right mix of uh, both uh, technology and human resources uh, right here in Ghana to kind of tackle this problem and get it done. I would certainly hope and, and visualize that at certain points Yamachi would grow maybe beyond cancer to be you know um, a, a titan of research um, global health research once again that happens to be headquartered in Accra I mean I think that is the dream that we will you know people will say the name Yamachi will become synonymous with research excellence and then people will then say hey they happen to be based in Accra um, and that allows us to redefine what it means to be an African company. And that is the Ghanaian startup pioneering cancer research in Africa. And that's our bulletin tonight. Thanks for watching, everyone. But there's more news on our website, myjournalline.com. Those are the trending stories. Ghana has opportunity to accelerate economic transformation and create more jobs. You can read more about that on our website myjoyonline.com. That's it. See you.